Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. <clears throat> My name is Michael Moret. Today we come to Psalm number 48, and we begin our study in verse 1. And Father, we ask that you would add your blessing to the word that we're about to study. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Psalm 48, verse 1. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. In the city of our God, his holy mountain. Great is the Lord. God is great. Greater than what we can fathom. God is great. Thing is, none of us are smart enough to know how great He really is. He is greater than we can imagine. And it's as great as the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation is the joy of all the earth Mount Zion in the far north the city of the great king Mount Zion in Jerusalem was the earthly residence of God you might say it is where the holy temple was and that's where his official presence was 3 within her citadels God has shown himself a sure defense. God has shown himself. We worship a God who we know. We know him from his word. We know him from what he has done in the past. He is a God, for example, that we know cares about us. He is a God that we know we can go to when the pressure is on. He is a refuge God, a Savior God. We know that from His Word that He has given us and from how He has acted in the past. <clears throat> Verse 4, For lo, the kings assembled, they came on together. You read the Old Testament, you will find many historical records of many evil kings who brought their armies to Jerusalem in order to conquer it. But, notice verse 5, as soon as they saw it, they were astounded. They were in a panic, and they took to flight. It is true that the enemies of God's people were often in a hurry to get to Jerusalem and to attack it. But when they understood that God was there protecting Israel, the enemy was in an even bigger hurry to get away. Verse 6 Trembling took hold of them there, anguish as of a woman in travail. And you'll read stories of that too, where God just sent a supernatural panic on the enemies of his people. A woman having a baby is going to experience a lot of pain. And God compares a woman having a baby to the enemies of Israel. Those who were intent on attacking Israel were filled with anguish once they realized that the living God was on Israel's side. 7. By the east wind thou didst shatter the ships of Tarsus. Still talking about the enemies of God's people. Back then, the military power of some nations was in their ships which was a pretty good thing pretty good until they turned into splinters after smashing into a rock or something and then you have Israel Israel in the Old Testament and Christians today we have something much better than a powerful army powerful ships we have an all powerful God who never fails, never crashes, never splinters. God is the perfect thing to trust in because He never falls apart and never fails. Verse 8 As we have heard, 
so have we seen in the city of the Lord of hosts in the city of our God which he establishes forever the Lord of hosts host means armies he's talking about armies of angels God is the commander of the angelic army and as long as Israel was obedient to God that army of angels had orders to fight on their behalf verse 9 we have fought on thy steadfast love O God in the midst of thy temple they meditated on the steadfast love of God that's talking about his continual mercy his kindness his love they meditated on it and they appreciated him as a result if people would take the time to think about how kind God has been to them they would appreciate him more if they would take the time to remember that anything good they have comes from God they definitely would not take it for granted or take him for granted verse 10 as thy name O God so thy praise reaches to the ends of the earth thy right hand is filled with victory God's name is known throughout the earth now that may sound different the name of God may sound different in different languages but all people everywhere know that he is there they may not know him but they know he is there and everyone everyone also knows that God is holy and that and they have to answer to God and answer to him on his terms 11 thy right hand is filled with victory let Mount Zion be glad let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of thy judgments be glad it's telling Israel to be glad because God will personally make sure that you will be treated fairly it hasn't always been that way in the past but it's going to happen and God must do that eventually or he wouldn't even be true to himself because he is a God of perfect justice right has to triumph unfairness must be punished and those who suffer unjustly must have that situation reversed those things have to happen verse 12 walk about Zion go round about her number her towers consider well her ramparts go through her citadels that you may tell the next generation he mentions a few landmarks in Jerusalem he's saying go look at and appreciate the fact that none of those Jerusalem landmarks are at all damaged by the enemy who wanted to do that take a look they're still standing it's good to be reminded that things could be much worse than they are and that is always the case for a Christian always even if a Christian has nothing good today they still have a great eternity things could be much worse 14 that this is God our God forever and ever he will be our guide forever if God is your God you can be sure that he is your guide also now it may not feel like it but do not go by feelings you may not like it but whether we like something or not does not determine if God is leading God guides us today and he will guide us after we die whether we sense it or feel it or not Psalm 49 verse 1 
Hear this, all peoples. Give ear, all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor, together. Notice, he's very demanding, isn't he? Hear this, all peoples. Give ear, all inhabitants of the world. He is commanding us to listen. He demands attention because he knows that what he is speaking is the word of God. Religion has no authority at all unless it is backed by the word of God. Some religious leaders are in the habit of preaching their personal preferences as if it was gospel truth. It isn't. This is their convictions. Someone else's personal preferences do not have to be yours. I don't care I don't care who that someone is. No religious leader has the right to do that. No one has the authority to insist that their personal preferences be yours as an adult. <coughs> Verse three My mouth shall speak wisdom. The meditation of my heart shall be understanding. He will speak the word of God. He says that is in his heart. It is the meditation of his heart. That's what he's going to speak. The word of God spoken by someone who knows that it's true will make the biggest impression on those who listen. The Holy Spirit uses the word that is spoken with conviction, not the word that is spoken with apology. 4. I will incline my ear to a proverb I will solve my riddle to the music of the lyre. In other words, he's saying that he won't tell others to believe and act on something that he himself does not believe and act upon. The first step in getting others to follow Christ as they should is to follow Christ as we should. Verse 5 Why should I fear in times of trouble? when the iniquity of my persecutors surrounds me? In other words, why should I fear the things that the unrighteous fear? It doesn't make sense. Why fear with the unrighteous, the ungodly fear? They fear some things that we should not fear, according to the writer. And of course, the most fearful thing to the person who has set their hearts on the things of this world instead of on God the most fearful thing for that person is the idea of leaving this world because that is where their values are that is where their treasure is they're afraid to leave this world not so for us who have put Christ first we don't have to be afraid in fact we may even look forward to the thing that the world fears which is leaving this world 6 men who trust in their wealth and boast of the abundance of their riches those who believe that wealth will give them everything that is good and also cause them to avoid evil, trouble they have made wealth their God. They may not call him, call it their God, but it is. If they put their trust in that wealth to give them everything good and avoid evil, it has become their God. And wealth may be able to buy them enough toys to forget about eternity for a while. But not forever, because when death is near, they will know that their wealth will fail them. And they will be afraid, and they should be afraid. 7. Truly no man can ransom himself or give to God the price of his life. No one can buy their way out of hell. No offering is big enough to pay for our sins. Verse 8 
for the ransom of his life is costly and can never suffice that he should continue to live on forever and never see the pit in other words an immortal soul is way too valuable to be ransomed by worldly wealth there isn't enough wealth there isn't enough money in the entire world even if you possessed it all to buy even one soul out of hell that's how valuable a soul is 10 yea he shall see that even the wise die the fool and the stupid alike must perish and leave their wealth to others every rich but impenitent sinner should carefully note that even the wealthy die take a look even the wealthy die people may be street smart and people may be skilled at making money but they cannot outsmart death 11 their graves are their homes forever their dwelling places to all generations though they name lands their own yeah think about it so a very wealthy but godless person donates money tax write off you know when he gets a building named after him or maybe a street named after him or maybe even an entire town named after him well you know what doesn't help him one bit not in eternity so what if they named a building after him or a street or a town they cannot live in that place forever simply because it was named after them they lay in a little plot of dirt like everyone else 12 man cannot hide or man cannot abide in his pomp he is like the beast that perish those whose God is their wealth should remember that even the most celebrated people die just like an animal dies and returns to dust just like an animal does the money that many people love and trust in is a pitiful God when they realize that they need a real God verse 13 this is the fate of those who have foolish confidence the end of those who are pleased with their portion and God says that that's the pathetic end of those who trust in themselves or in anything or anyone other than God it's not a good end and there are no exceptions it is the pathetic end of everyone who thinks like that and who does that 14 like sheep they are appointed for Sheol that is the place of the dead death shall be their shepherd straight to the grave they descend and their form shall waste away Sheol shall be their home a sinner's body wastes away just like an animal no matter how much money they have those who invest in this world to the exclusion of God will end up far away from all their wealth they will lose the power and the influence that their wealth gives them in this life they will lose it every bit of it at death it will do them no good at all 15 but God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol for he will receive me and there's the difference the one who belongs to God through Jesus Christ will be received by God in eternity that person will be delivered from the grave that person will live again he never stops living spiritually his soul never stops living but even physically he will live again better than ever unlike the person who has excluded God 16 be not afraid when one becomes rich 
when the glory of his house increases. The temporary success of the wicked is too small a thing to get upset about. In other words, don't let it bug you when the godless have it made. And for sure, do not question the justice of God over it. 17. For when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not go down after him. Not one thread of his $1,000 suit will go with the godless person to hell. Not one dollar from his stuffed bank account will go with him to hell. And none of his honor, and none of his popularity, and none of his titles will go with him to hell. The flames of hell respect no one. He will have no honor. No one who rejects Christ deserves honor. 18. Though while he lives, he counts himself happy, and though a man gets praise when he does well for himself, there are those who have a happy life. They don't know God. They don't care about God, but they do have a happy life. And they are respected. Others look at them and applaud their success. And I'll tell you what, talent and hard work and persistence can get a person those things. They make a good living. God rewards their work with success in this world. But, verse 19, He will go to the generation of His fathers who will never more see the light. There's the bad part. The successful man who excludes God dies just like everyone else. And his body will return to dust just like the poor man's body. And it gets worse. Because he excluded God, he enters eternal suffering. <clears throat> and that life he had on earth is quickly forgotten. 19 again. He will go to the generation of his fathers who will never more see the light. Eternal darkness, eternal hell. That is what it is. And since it is eternal, he will never get out. He will never return to the earth. He will never again enjoy the wealth that he left behind. Someone else is going to enjoy it. He excluded God. He will enjoy nothing. 20. Man cannot abide in his pomp. He is like the beast that perish. No one, no matter how much of this world they own, can hang on to it beyond death. They cannot stop themselves from dying, and they don't enjoy the things they once had once they're gone. <clears throat> Psalm 50. The Mighty One, <coughs> excuse me, the Mighty One, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Almighty God will summon every human being from everywhere to stand before Him. No one will be excused on the great day of judgment. <clears throat> Verse 2 Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. In the past, God's glory literally shined out of the temple in Jerusalem. When Christ returns on Judgment Day, His glory will be brighter than ever. It will be a physical light. It will be a spiritual light. His holy presence is going to reveal every sinful flaw in the souls of men. And only those who have found mercy through Jesus Christ will survive that day. 3. Our God comes, He does not keep silence. Before Him is a devouring fire, round about Him a mighty tempest. Oh, what a, what a frightful event Judgment Day will be. Christ will return, 
The Bible says in the midst of loud thunder, he will be surrounded by a devastating fire and a huge storm is going to be raging all around him. Frightful thought. Fearful. God is trying to tell us something. Whether these things are literal or not is not the issue. God is trying to tell us that Judgment Day is really going to put everything in proper perspective. There will be no arrogance in that day. Everyone will be humbled as they stand before Almighty God. 4. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. All people are God's people. He will judge his people. All people are God's people. Which is why they are accountable to him. The owner has a right to inspect what he owns, right? And the owner has a right to judge whether it's worth keeping or not. That's what Judgment Day is for. 5. Gather to me, my faithful ones, who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. God will have his faithful ones on Judgment Day. And the sacrifice that he is talking about here is the death of Jesus Christ. Those who have received Christ and lived out that faith, proving that it was real, are the ones who will live in the presence of God forever. God saves his faithful ones. 6. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. On judgment day, God will display the evidence against the wicked. It will be public, and then they will be banished. Consequently, all will know that God is righteous for sending the wicked where they really have chosen to go of their own free will. And because it was all made public and the evidence was laid out, no one will pity them. No one will think that they deserve another chance. 7. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. God here brings his charges against the nation Israel. Way back in the Old Testament days, God chose them to be his people, and they professed to be his people, but they had not been acting like his people. And he says in verse 8, I do not reprove you for your sacrifices. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. And it's not that Israel wasn't keeping up their religious system. That's not what had God upset. He didn't have any complaints about that. They were bringing their sacrifices regularly. They were a well-oiled religious machine. But he says in verse 9, I will accept no bull from your house, nor he goat from your folds. In other words, God says, It's not really animal sacrifices that I want from you. 10. He says, For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the air, and all that moves in the field is mine. God didn't need their animals. All the animals in the world already belong to God. Every animal in the world is at God's disposal. They will do what he tells them to do any time he wants them to do it. He doesn't need their sacrifices. He goes on to say in verse 12, If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world and all that is in it is mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. God didn't approve certain sacrifices for Israel because he needed the meat. God wants the devotion of his people. If he has that, then he will receive our sacrifices. Then he will receive our offerings. He will receive our offerings and our sacrifices, not because he needs them, but because they are expressions of our inner devotion to him. That sort of thing means an awful lot to God.